This is Geoffrey Beavers. And you will obey me. You will listen to the Sirens of Audio. Well, I'll be your doctor for this consultation. How can I be of assistance? Well, I have a bit of an embarrassing problem. Don't be embarrassed. It's only you and me here. Please, tell me what's troubling you. Well, every time I put on these headphones, an audio drama of just any description starts playing in my ears. Are you telling me you don't have any control over your listening experience? That's exactly right. I'll get this burning sensation in my head and... Yes? Go on. Well, I'm feeling very ashamed to say. Are you wanting to tell me that you begin to enjoy the random audio drama? Yes, Doctor. I do. Well, I hate to tell you this, but I think you have possibly the worst case of randomoids I have ever seen. No. Not randomoids. Anything but randomoids. Is there a cure? I'm sorry to have to inform you, sir, but I think you're a terminal case. No! <laughs> G'day audiophiles, this is the Sirens of Audio, the show that explores the universe of Doctor Who in the audio medium. I'm Dwayne. And I'm Philip. G'day Dwayne, g'day audiophiles. G'day Philip, how are you? I am excellent, thank you. I'm well. Excellent. What's so good? I know, it's been a great week, satisfying week. Things are, weather's been beautiful, lots of sun. it's, 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 um, It's drying up after three years of rain every single day. We've now got about three weeks without rain. I can just see the heat's coming. It's going to be a bad summer. Mm. Anyhow, I'm enjoying the I'm enjoying the lovely warm winter down here. Anyhow, I've got some news too. Um, I just booked my uh, passage to the mainland on with my caravan. Ooh, so you're going to do the big trip. It is happening. It is happening this time. Lots of plans are starting to happen for people after a few years of delay. So that's a that's a good thing. But anyway, this episode is another of what we like to call... We've got Randomoids. Ah! Yes, it's Randomoids time once again. And we selected a couple of stories from the TARDIS cookie jar. Uh, from... Uh, uh, who, who were they? I, I, I know there was... Oh no, we didn't select two. We selected one, which was Cobwebs. Uh, that was our friend, good friend Teresa. And because we, pulled, we drew out a box set, you had to choose one. That's me, right, Philip. Which was uh, death and the queen. Now, normally we we jump down a rabbit hole, but uh, I won't today because we're just going to talk about these stories. But boy, I've I've had some rabbit hole viewing and listening lately. I can tell you that. Really? Um, oh, the, the rabbit holes I've been going down. I um, I've been listening. I, well, today I'll, be, I'll have to probably backtrack. I I've been watching a show called Jamaica Inn. Now, it's been made, remade a few times, Jamaica Inn. I think there was a recent series. Then there's the 1983 television television series. And there's the Alfred Hitchcock one from the 1930s. And uh, I was first introduced to the, to the acting skills of Patrick McGowan in the 1983 version, uh, which also starred Jane Seymour. Do you, did you ever see that? No. It is, are, they great, it is an, are they great performers? Oh, but uh, Patrick McGowan was sensational. So that was the first thing I ever saw him in, be- before even The Prisoner. But the reason I mentioned that is because what led me to start to dig that out of my archive was that I came across an audio version that I had sitting there that I hadn't that was in my queue to listen to. And I was listening away and I thought, I know that voice, the guy who plays uh, Joss Merlin, who is the Patrick McGowan character on the TV series. It was John Woodvine. So oh, okay. and and he had one role in Doctor Who, didn't he? No. Only in the Armageddon Factor as the Marshal. 
Oh. Yes, okay. Yes, that was the only role he had, I think. I was trying, I was trying I had a feeling, I, okay, who am I mixing up for um, Frontier in Space? The the um, Prince, I thought it was John Woodvine too, but obviously... Oh, that's, that's, he's also in Terror of the Zygon, Spearhead from Space, isn't he? Yes, that's, that's not John Oh, Wood. no, not the Prince, not the Prince. I can't, I can't think who it is. Okay. But certainly not John Woodvine, I know that. Okay. And what I've sort of been following John Woodvine around because in I, I did a rewatch recently of the tripods um, and John Woodvine plays one of the Alien Masters. I know you haven't seen it, Philip, but uh, in the second series, we, we come face to face with the aliens who are inside the tripods and John Woodvine is the voice of that. So, boy, a rabbit hole of discovery in my place. It's never ending. Exactly. I've still probably I've still probably got stuff lying around that I need to listen to, but anyway, we'll go, I've got to listen to too much stuff for this podcast. So so there you go. The first one we'll have a look at because we also have the special treat of John Johnny Morris joining us for part of this episode because he's he was the author of Cobwebs and he's uh, given us some very interesting little snippets that we're going to share with you shortly. So we'll start off with uh, Death and the Queen, which is a 10th Doctor story, eh? Sounds good. All right, let me read the blurb for it. Donna Noble has never been lucky in love. So when one day her prince does come, she's thrilled to have the wedding of all weddings to look forward to. Though the Doctor isn't holding his breath for an invitation. And her future mother-in-law is certainly not amused. But on the big day itself... Donna finds her castle under siege from the darkest of forces, marching at the head of a skeleton army. When it looks like even the Doctor can't save the day, what will Queen Donna do to save her people from death itself? Coming soon from Big Finish Productions. Doctor Who, The Tenth Doctor Adventures. Calibris, brilliant place. An entirely mechanical planet. Catch, hitch, fuel, fix, buy, pretty much any kind of transportation in existence. This empire's a massive leap in user-friendly tech. Meadow Digital's ahead of the game on the chipsets. Quadruple core nano circuits and a sleek, sexy designer package. Ultra thin, look. You're talking, but it's all geek to me. Can we go? Yeah, I suppose. Hey, hey! Robots running amok. Donna, we're on. Remain where you are. Bex, grab my hand. Go, Donna. One of us needs to. And I just I can't. Come on, if you're common. Don't want a dislocated shoulder for nothing. Do not run. We require test subjects. Ah, there it is. Vagabond's Reach, Tavern of Taverns, most feared social environment in the galaxy. You've never been up Sugar Heart on a Tuesday. You don't know everything about me. Ready? Is this the front door? They don't even have bouncers. Yeah, basically, think of them all as bouncers. Watch out! Oh, ah, thanks. Doctor, what is happening, Doctor? I'm, I'm hanging on to your banner. Ah, oh, there's a skeleton around my neck. Oh. Oh, that has definitely never happened before. Big finish. We love stories. What are you saying? They fizzled in somehow? Like the TARDIS? Yeah, Transmat from another dimension. The, the, the TARDIS doesn't fizzle. It's more of a... Death of the Queen by James Goss, The Fact and the Trivia. Directed by Nicholas Briggs, produced by David Richardson, script edited by Matt Fitton. Sound design and music by Howard Carter. Starring David Tennant as the Doctor, Catherine Tate as Donna Noble, Blake Ritson as Rudolph, Alice Krieg as the Queen Mum, Beth Chalmers as Hortez, and Alan Cox as Death. This is episode 1.3 in the 10th Doctor Adventures. Recorded on the 22nd of October 2015 at the Mo Studios and released in May 2016. It was released as a single story but all three stories in this series were released in the same month. There was also 
at this time released a limited box set with Technophobia and Time Reaver, the other two stories in the trilogy, in May 2016. So you can either buy it as a special box set or individually. And it was released again as a standard box set in February 2017. I've got a feeling it may be released as an LP too, but I need to confirm that. The limited box set was 5,000 copies and was with a lavish book size set, including exclusive artwork, photographs, articles, and a one hour documentary with interviews and a bonus documentary about the works of world of Doctor Who at Big Finish. This is part of a trilogy of stories that brought the 10th Doctor to the Big Finish. And although David Tennant had done a lot of work for Big Finish before, this is the first time he gets to play as the Doctor. This is the first time that Catherine Tate works for Big Finish. Blake Whitson would return to Big Finish to be cast as Adam Adamant. Alice Krieg is best known to many people for playing the Borg Queen in Star Trek First Contact, but also Voyager, Lower Decks, and most recently Picard. And although she was reported dead by the internet in July last year, she's actually still alive and well. Beth Chalmers is the Big Finish regular, and we spoke to her a few weeks ago. Go have a listen. Alan Cox was a child actor who worked extensively in film and television. His main role for Big Finish was the Strand series as Ken Bright Thompson, son of Robin, a workaholic who neglected his son. Great series to listen to as well. And the script here is by James Goss, and it bears all his usual dark humour that you expect from him as a writer. And that's the facts and the trivia. So this was your choice because we pulled a box set and we needed a single story. So let me ask you, Philip, although I think I know your answer, are you happy with your choice? Oh, yes. <laughs> so much so. It's, I, I first started listening to this and I thought, wow, the chemistry between David Tennant and Catherine Tate is just magical and it's still there, perhaps even better than it was on TV. Yeah, I, I do think this series in particular, I, I haven't had a chance to go back and listen to the first two stories. Um, I mean, the reason why I pulled it was it's 10th Doctor. We haven't done a 10th Doctor in our randomoids, so I wanted to choose it for that reason. And I do remember just this one being particularly funny and clever, which is why I wanted to go back and listen to it. I, I really wish I'd had time now to listen to the first two. My memories, as I listened to the three of them in order, was this was by far the best of the trilogy. But to be fair, this was even better than I remembered it. So I, sh I do need to go back and listen to the other two as well. But I think you're right. I think the chemistry between the Doctor and Donna, the the script, the interplay, their quick banter with each other. It's, the timing. It's, yeah, it is just perfect Doctor Donna. And that makes me more excited about what's going to happen in November. That's exactly what I was going to say. When I was listening to this, I was going, oh, wow, this is going to be great uh, when, we, when we get these specials come out. You're talking about the... The special edition as well, the limited edition. What number yes, have I, you got? I've got 2,630 is mine. I didn't pull mine out. I should go have a look. But yes, and, and that's probably the last, that could be the last physical purchase I bought from Big Finish. There might be a few more. But I, I do remember David Tennant coming to Big Finish was huge, the 10th Doctor coming. Mm. Um, because it's, it was the first modern Doctor. And yeah. so, yeah, Big Finish by this stage has been going, what, 15 years or so. And for, for the first time, a new series Doctor was coming. And so it was huge. And they made a huge yeah. thing out of it. And, and that's yeah. special. That, that, that is a beautiful box set. It is. It smells great. I love smelling things like <laughs> smells that. smells good. Okay. It does. I, I, I think the illustration... It's not a scratch and sniff, but it just oh, smells good. When you... brew, but okay. It smells good. On you, <laughs> Yeah. Um, I really enjoyed this. I thought some of the ideas were interesting. Because I was listening to this in the car... I, I missed a couple of things. So I was I was trying to work out what this what this country was, and I, I missed a couple of little points, but they all sort of came together in the end. And or I also want to go back and listen to all three of these stories too. And I seem to remember what are the other two stories called? Technophobia and Time Reaver. I remember being impressed with every one of them. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure they were all good. But I, I do recall being especially impressed with this one. And um, I notice on the, I think we're both looking at the website of the single release of this story. And yep. it's got every actor on there except Beth Chalmers. Poor Beth. She's not there. It says featuring Alice, Alan and Blake, but no Beth. Yeah. I mean, to be honest. But she's other, in there too. The, the others are bigger names. Um, even though it's just a big Finnish family, Beth's all ours, 
but in terms of um, out, outward knowledge of people, the, 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 the others are all big, bigger names. I mean, it, once again, and actually, if you look at if you go to the box and look at the whole cast listing for people who are in all the stories, they have managed to pull the most amazing casts for these three stories. Yeah, you know, they've they've not hold held back at all. No, no, they've got yeah, you know, Dr. Donna. They've managed to pull in so many huge names to, to come and actually do these things. And yeah, I mean, Alice Krieg is a huge name in in, in um, fan circles. What was she in recently? She was in another big Finnish release just recently. What was she it? She was. It was the fifth Doctor box set, Conflicts of Interest. I knew that was it. Uh, yep. Some, I knew it was something recent, I mean I mean to say. Yeah. But the, I, the other I, thing I, about... I, I, I remember being quite upset when I heard she was dead. <laughs> Funny that the whole thing was just a fake. Just like, oh, you're kidding me. Anyhow. Yeah. People like to it's happened. To, it's happened a couple of times now to a couple of different people. It has. Well, one thing about stories written in that era for television was the amazing way Russell T Davies could do it, and Stephen Moffat could do it too. They could, they could explain a complex piece of science fiction in a single line, and it was done here too in this. It, um, so James Goss has done a great job in tapping into their their way of storytelling. So I think there's a line in there about uh, how the aliens were were, were um, some of the best, ma- they were the best makers of um, perception filters perception or filters. something. Yeah. And, and so that explains a whole heap of stuff because we know what perception filters are and explains a whole heap of stuff in a very, very short space of time. So it's very clever. I think it's yeah. very clear. I'm very in, in awe of that type of storytelling, actually. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I still think James Scott is one of the best writers Big Fish have in terms of humour and interplay and just clever twists. And, um, yeah, I'm always impressed by everything he writes. And he, the whole series of torture he did for over 12 months, every story was absolutely brilliant. And this is another one. It's just, yeah, every, everything about it is funny. It's clever. Um, the, it, I think the interplay of Donna, the, what they do with her character, um, Another Wedding, so Donna, her weddings are just hilarious at all times, um, and she, once again, and she just plays so beautifully off of the people in in the cast. Um, you know, her playing against Blake Richardson as Rudolph. Um, all their scenes are so funny. I, th- I think in many ways Donna really does steal the whole show. Um, you know, the Doctor's there as the second character, as a bit of a foil. Um, Donna does some solutions. The Doctor's the final solution. Is his job to do that? But really, it's, it's a Donna play and. Yeah, Donna just shines. Absolutely. Anything else you want to say about this? No, I'm happy. Just make sure you go listen to it. Oh, if 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 you listen to any Tenth Doctor story, listen to this one, but preferably just get the whole lot. You won't be disappointed with this whole set, actually. No. Series one of the Tenth Doctor Adventures for Big Finish. Okay, let's move move on to the next story that was chosen for us by drawing it from the TARDIS cookie jar. And this is Teresa's story. This is um, the fifth Doctor story, Cobwebs, featuring the TARDIS team of uh, Tegan, Turlo, and Nyssa, and the fifth Doctor back together again. How is that possible? We're about to find out. And here is the blurb. You know what cobwebs mean? Spiders. In search of a cure for a sickness that has so far claimed six billion lives, scientist Nyssa arrives at an abandoned gene tech facility on the toxic planet Helheim. Hell hole, more like. This is not alone. The TARDIS has also been drawn to the Helheim base, and in its cobweb-coated corridors, she soon runs into the Doctor, Tegan and Turlo, her travelling companions of half a century past. But who or what has engineered this strange reunion? The Black Guardian, perhaps? The answer's here, in the dark, with the crack tids. In the Cobwebs. Coming soon from Big Finish Productions, Doctor Who, Cobwebs. Yes, sterile atmosphere, gravity normal. Let's take a look outside, shall we? I thought I saw something move near the access shaft. I don't want to alarm you, but there's something in the ship with us. Oh, great. 
Another gloomy corridor. Warning! Threat mode activated. What are you doing here? This is a top security facility. I don't take orders from saboteurs. You have to stop this. It's cold-blooded murder. Everyone in this station is going to end up dead. Whatever you do, Tegan, don't move. Is that the best you can do? This is my life you're talking about. Turlo's life, and this is life, your life. I always knew you would return one day. That the four of you would come back to me. Tegan, Nyssa, Turlo, and the Doctor. Oh, no. Hmm? Oh, cobwebs, yes. Odd that. Subscribers get more at bigfinish.com. Cobwebs by Jonathan Norris, the facts and the trivia. Directed by Barnaby Edwards, produced by David Richardson, script edited by Alan Barnes, and sound design and music by Steve Foxton. Starring Peter Davison, Sarah Sutton, John Fielding, and Mark Strickson. Number 136 in the monthly range. Recorded on the 29th of December and the 4th... Uh, sorry... Recorded on the 29th of December 2009 and the 4th of January 2010 at the Mode Studios. Released July 2010. Janet Fielding had been talked into returning to the role of Tegan by Gary Russell during an Australian Doctor Who convention. This had happened in 2006 with Tegan appearing in what would have been her real age. She'd been effectively killed off or was at least given a terminal illness. Four years later, Janet is talking to coming back. Partly because she realises that without Tegan, it's hard to play stories of the Fifth Doctor era, as Tegan is the linchpin to the whole era. This is the first in the trilogy of stories that Janet would enjoy so much that she'd keep returning. The story is set two days after Nyssa left the Doctor, and Tegan and Turlow, but 50 years after leaving for Nyssa. Though Trachonites, oh, is that the right word? Trachonites? Trachonites age very slowly. And although Nissa is now 70, she only appears to be 40. Cobwebs is a very timey-wimey story and begins to set up a lot of scenarios that will play out over many stories to come. It begins at the very end of the Doctor Who story Enlightenment, taking up the conversations from that story. And that's the facts and the trivia. Well, this, Philip, was a landmark story, wasn't it? This was something that was... We talked about the excitement of having the 10th Doctor... But five years before that, we had this, and we had Janet Fielding re well, coming to Big Finish virtually for the first time as a regular. She came as a one-off. We all assumed it would be a one-off. But now we had the first in a trilogy of stories, which would go on and is still continuing to this day. So this was a, a landmark story, which was very... I remember being very excited about this one. It's very weird. It doesn't feel like the landmark story. It just, I mean, Janet Fielding just feels like part of the furniture big finish. There's hardly a fifth story, Doctor's story that comes out that she's not in. Yeah, you and forget you, that there was a time, a long you, time, where she wasn't there. Yeah, exactly. You, you forget there was, there was 11 years before Janet actually started. Yeah, you know, she was one of the hardest people to get to come back. And yet now she's just so familiar and so embedded in big finish that, that you know, most people wouldn't realise that there was that time where you just didn't think she was going to come. And yet she establishes herself immediately with the story. Like from the first scene with her argument with the Doctor, Tegan's back with no doubt. And yeah, you know, the, the previous story four years earlier, I enjoyed that, but it was a bit cerebral. It was a bit out there. I enjoyed it, but it, was, it wasn't what I really wanted. This was what I wanted. This was Tegan back playing the character. Janet's, Janet's captured her voice straight away. Arguments with Turlo, arguments with the Doctor, but yet still a heart and a compassion. Um, a, a spirit and a fight, you know, a real fight. And even though in some ways you, you could, it was all about Janet coming back. The other companions, you know, Sarah Sutton and Mark, Mark Strickson, they don't play lesser roles. They, their roles are, are huge. And, and it's interesting that the, I think these, the four characters are really dominating everything. So there, is a, there are three other human characters in it, plus robots, and they all have a part to play, but their story is secondary. 
the story is really about the four regulars getting back together again, solving the problem. There's interplay with other characters, but the other characters just kind of disappear in the background. They're not, they're not important, but everything's about the main characters. I think that's why I enjoy this so much. With, with the main premise being that they go through the first episode and then come across some bodies that they presume to be themselves because it's all dressed in their clothing and whatever. It looks very much them? like them. It's proven, they, it, it's proven to be them. DNA, everything, it's, it's them. It's, a, it's all there. So very, very similar. I couldn't help but think of the, the Space Museum. However, the Space Museum went for a cracking first episode to, <laughs> some might say, a bland uh, further three episodes or following three episodes. This, however, um, keeps, it's a very, you've got to keep listening to it because it's quite complex. And uh, I struggle in my old age, Philip, with the timey-wimey stuff, but there's lots of timey-wimey in this one. If you like that kind of thing, this will be your cup of tea. And the resolution itself, uh, I thought was just so, um, it was so, what's the word I'm looking for? Give me, give me the word. It was, well, it was, it, it was surprising, um, but it, it was okay. unexpected. Yeah. It was, it was really unexpected. Like, I, I can't I thought, believe I've forgotten this. I mean, I mean, I, I mean, I, I can, I've listened, listened to hundreds and maybe thousands true. of things since then. True. I mean, I haven't listened to this since it came out, which, you know, going back and listening to it again, it was so good. And, mm. I, and, I, and I now, I, it's actually made me think I have to keep going now with, with all the trilogies. And I think there's four or five trilogies that these guys carry. They, they end up in the East space as well at one stage. For I think one or two trilogies as well. I, so, they do. They do. Yeah. So I, I, I've only ever listened to these stories once. So I really want to go. I really need to find time now and just listen to just these characters and their trilogies. Because this is back when Big Finish was making um, a trilogy of each of the three doctors that they had. Because they only had Peter Davison, Colin Baker, Sylvester McCrory. Um, maybe Tom Baker was coming back, but Tom Baker wasn't part of the main range. He was doing his own, he started off doing his own series. So you had a trilogy of those three, and then the other three. And then three, at this time, I think uh, Lucy Miller was going strong at this point. For the Eighth Doctor, you're right. Um, and then the other three would often be just a one off story for each of the Doctors or something different. Um, so, th so it was only like once a year you'd get a trilogy. I think, I'm pretty sure there was another trilogy at the end of this year of these characters because they, they brought them. When they had Janet in a good mood at the start and they weren't sure she'd say yes too often, she had such a good time after this trilogy, she said yes straight away. And so they got her back in the studio as fast as they could so that she couldn't change her mind. Like what they did with Paul McGann, actually. Paul McGann had such a good time with the first season. He was doing the second season within months because I thought, oh, it may be the only chance we get. In the end, of course, they have such a good time. They stay and they keep staying on and on. Um, I the just thought that, it, I thought of the word that I was trying to think of before yeah, about, the word? The, about the ending. It was very original. Yes, um, I, I don't think I'd seen it before, and uh, that I, I really enjoyed that because you've, you know, I'd seen the space museum, and and uh, from what Jonathan is about to tell us, that you know, it's not it's, the premise is not original, but certainly the resolution was in this case, and I I, I felt very refreshed as a result of uh, of of the ending of this story. Well, yeah, a little bit, it's not actually it's smaller. In the first episode, there's seven deaths that you see, and yet none of them end up being quite what you expect. All of them are transforming. So it, 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 Johnny's had a good time with us, and he, he plays around with his audience no end. And I can understand, you know, Johnny's going to say that, you know, there's a few times Jan couldn't quite understand what's going on. Do you think things made sense? They do all make sense, but it is complicated, and you have to keep going backwards and forwards in time to, to understand why this happened here because of this. Um, yeah, there's lo lots of lays in this story. Well, speaking of Johnny Morris, should we get him on? That's a great idea. So thank you, Jonathan Morris, for joining us again. Good to see you. Hey, lovely to be here, and uh, lovely to have a, a another trip down uh, memory lane. Yes, back to whenever this came out. Yeah, so we're discussing Cobwebs, which came out in 2010. So it's 13 years old now, which is hard to believe because I remember this coming out so like it was yesterday. Um, it's a significant script because it was the, it was bringing back Tegan for the first time. Janet Fielding was returning. She had done a one-off script four years earlier, but this was now her returning as her proper character as Tegan. 
Do you remember why, how you got the brief for this? It was uh, very important, I think, uh, that Janet had sort of agreed in principle to come back just for, I think it was three stories or something. It wasn't, it wasn't like um, an ongoing thing at all. And uh, the brief was just to, to, um, to make it enjoyable. For her, I think to make it um, so that it wasn't uh, so that she had a lot to do, lots of cool stuff to play, um, lots of stuff where um, the character's motivations were logical and clear, and um, and where she gave as good as she got. I mean, Tegan always did that anyway, but um, you know, I mean, I I know that um, Janet quite rightly sort of had complaints about how. The companions, particularly uh, the female companions, were sort of sidelined in Doctor Who uh, during her time. Um, you know, I mean, Tegan normally got quite a lot to do, but you'd you'd find that um, Nissa then didn't. You know, they'd, if someone was awake for an episode, someone else would be asleep. So uh, it was to make sure that she, um, so that it, it it was a good Tegan story, I think, essentially. Um, and even after I'd written the first draft, I got notes back from the script editor, who I think was Alan Barnes, correct me if I'm wrong. That's correct. Uh, um, saying that I'd, I'd started it with a scene of um, Nissa in her spaceship with her robot friend. And he was going, no, no, don't do it. It has, it has to start 10, 10 seconds after the end of Enlightenment. It has to pick up from where Enlightenment left off. And it has to be the most tegan scene ever. You know, it has to be... Um, she has to be arguing, she has to be putting her foot down, and she has to be quoting her Aunt Vanessa. And it has to be sort of, a, we have to start with like a two minute, boom, Tegan's greatest hits to sort of get back into the character. You know, to sort of go, you know, this is, she's back with a bang, basically. It's not going to be, you know, a story which happens to have Tegan in. Oh no, it's a, it's a, it's a Tegan story. So, um, and when I came to, uh, putting together the story. The other thing was to make sure that it was about the regulars, really. Um, so episode one is pretty much just them. I think we get the, we have the robot. Uh, yeah, the robot's robot computer friend, is all, yeah. And we have, a, we have probably have a sinister computer in there. Um, but generally it's just the, um, and we might get ghosts. I think there's a couple of ghosts. But um, uh, generally it's just the regulars. And even the, later on, you know, when there's the, the sort of the crew of the space, of the, of the base it's still about the regulars the, the cliffhangers are all about the regulars and stuff it's not what, what people some people might say was a a character-led story because the characters are facing this sort of um i don't know what you, how would you call it a sort of a, a, a time paradox problem it's quite an abstract problem about predeterminism and how time travel works and stuff you know they, they and it's how they react to it, you know, because um, the doctor's going, oh, there, there's the rules of time. And this is sort of nods along with him because she's very clever. And Tegan just sort of puts her foot there and goes, nobody told me the rules of time. I do what I like. I, nobody's, I don't care if my future is pure or date. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do something else. Sorry, I, I think I might have drifted into an accent there, but you know what I mean. Yeah. You're not a bad one, too. So, so that was your. So you took off his executive enlightenment. Did you watch enlightenment, or did you just know that how it ended enough to go straight with the script? Um, I had a bit of fun with it. Uh, going from the end of enlightenment to the beginning of King's Demons, it doesn't really join perfectly well. Um, because you you have Tegan going, uh, is this another Black Guardian trap or something? And I remember talking to someone going, they should have been like a whole run of like nine nine stories where they're all Black Guardian traps. <laughs> so, so when you get to the King's Demons, it's the tenth one. Um, but uh, it doesn't pick up on any of the sort of issues raised in um, Enlightenment. It doesn't, uh, which is stuff I put in cobwebs, like uh, Turlo hasn't apologised for what he was doing. He hasn't um, really... Um, spoken to Tegan about what he did, about why he did what he did. Um, we don't really learn when the Doctor 
found out that uh, Turlo was trying to kill him. That that sort of moment is uh, underplayed, should we say, in uh, in unlike in enlightenment. Uh, not even sure where it is. I think it's sort of around the end of part two, but um, you would blink, you can blink and miss it, to be honest, because um, it's not. I mean, it should be, you know, a huge part of the story. It should be wow. The doctor has found out that Tello's trying to kill him. He confronts him, and you've got a you've got a huge dramatic scene there. You've got a huge and because it always sort of felt like it was sort of um, added on to an existing story, there was not room for it anymore. So with cobwebs, I was going, okay, let's have some of the fallout. Um, it might not be um, what my story's about. But I'm going to go, okay, when, I, when I'm when i working out my plot, I'm going to go, okay, here's four minutes for the Doctor and Turlo just to talk about stuff, which is what you would do now. You, because in modern Doctor Who and stuff, um, if there is an issue with the relationships that come up, you know, if someone's suffered a loss or um, been betrayed or something, they talk about it afterwards. Um, and that, there's lots of drama to be found there. Whereas in the 80s, it was all, let, let's try and move on move on uh um so yeah I, I was uh trying to do that in terms of enlightenment um and the other thing of course is it sort of picks up from terminus because it has uh nissa coming back after 50 years whatever it is which is probably your next question go can i just jump in there uh, because I, I did notice um, in Cobwebs that it was mentioned that from the events of Terminus to the events of Cobwebs, it had been two days. Was that expressly mentioned anywhere in the TV series, or is that something you came was two, up with? two days from when Nissa left. So that's yeah. A, um, yeah, that's right. So the, the, so the whole the of Enlightenment was, took was place over 48 hours, yeah. Yeah, yeah I think that's been quite generous, I think, because it more or less takes place in real time, to be honest. I mean, you could say it only took place in one day uh but i thought um they do kind of arrive in the morning there's a party that night they go to then it's the next day yeah so, so it, it always says two days kind of two i days. think um um because enlightenment follows on from terminus seamlessly there is that, that joins up there's no gap there so um so yeah i think uh, i mean obviously if you're in a tardis traveling through time and space it's approximate it's never exactly 48 hours it's just well i've been asleep twice since then so it was probably two days well it's not two i've been unconscious twice since then it's probably probably two days so there's a there is a question how were you asked to make her 50 years older who designed the whole because i guess it's in this Turlo and and t and never traveled together they obviously wanted to put those actors together so who came up with the idea of making this old yeah I mean, I think that was um, one of the things I know that one of the reasons that they persuaded Janet to come back was that it would be putting the putting the old team back together, as it were, where it would be her, Peter, Mark and Sarah. And obviously, as fans, we go, but that was never really the team, <laughs> you know, um, uh, they might be in two stories, but uh, Nissa and Turlo barely speak to each other. I mean, um, and so, so there's not really a huge relationship you can explore. Well, you can, because it hasn't been explored on television. Um, so it was just going, okay, we're putting the whole, the, that team back together, um, but there isn't really a gap in between Maudrin and Terminus to stick it in. So I'm, I'm sure it was Alan Barnes' idea to go, let's... Um, bring back Nyssa and have it set immediately after Enlightenment. I think I was sort of quite grumpy about that. I, for some reason, I was going, let's set it after the Five Doctors or something, but I don't know why. It was just a continuity niggle. Um, but actually, I think having it really close, having it two days for them and 50 days for Nyssa, 50 years for Nyssa, is always a sort of a, a is much more of a punch. And also you have the, the um, I think, which I think I explored later on in Prisoners of Fate, which is the fact that they haven't seen each other for 50 years means the Doctor now can't go back. He can't go back and and meet her in the intervening time because he's because that page of history has been written. You know that that um, 
that page of the TARDIS wiki has already been written. <laughs> it can never be changed. You get a different perspective there where everything for them is recent. And they're looking looking at her going, oh my God, you you look, you know, maybe 20 years older. And she's going, well, this is incredibly weird. Um, you, It's exactly where I left you. You haven't changed a bit. So, and the other, the other um, point with that was to go, okay, this, this has been, you know, it picks up from Terminus. It's um, that she's been working, going around the galaxy, curing diseases and stuff um, independently. I mean, she hasn't really sort of settled down and had a family or anything. She's been devoted to her, um, her biochemistry. And, um, but she's grown up a little bit. She's not, well, she's sort of a, sort of a Shakespearean ingenue, I think, sometimes in some of her stories, where she's sort of, they play up the naivety. This is someone who um, uh, has had horrible things to happen to her, but she's sort of, she has no maturity at all. I mean, she's not immature. She's not um, petulant or childish, but um, there's no life experience there. And I think with um, innocence, isn't it? She's got the innocence always. Innocence, yeah. Um, whereas bringing it back, she's going, okay, she's she's a bit tougher. She's a bit um, she she's she knows her own mind. She's very self confident in herself, and she's not going to be one of those. She's not going to be a character who disappears from scenes. Um, you know, on television, she'll be sometimes there'll be scenes where this is in the room, uh, react, 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 but um, she doesn't have any lines. And on audio, you can't do that. In audio, someone has to be, if someone's in a scene, you want them to say something, you know, as soon as possible within the first. If there's four people in the room, then generally the first four lines in that scene are those four people each having a say uh, to establish they're in the room. So you need Nissa to be going. I have an opinion. I think we should do this, um, or I want to explain this, and not to have her just going, "What's happening, Doctor? I'm scared. I don't understand. I agree." You know, those are rubbish things. I mean, they're rubbish things for um, the character. They're rubbish things for the actor to play. And I think don't think listeners would put up with it anymore. I think listeners really want the characters to be the bigger version, the more three-dimensional versions that they got in their heads when they're watching it and when they're in, their, um, in the fan fiction and in the novels and stuff where they're, they were much more developed and more three-dimensional as characters. And I think that's what, what people expect quite rightly now, rather than the slightly sort of um, uh, sort of cookie cutter, Weetabix cutout card versions of the characters that you sometimes got in the 80s. There's a very large time paradox with in the at the end of well the beginning and the end of the show had no spoilers but in terms of had you worked through how you were going to solve that paradox before you started was the plan all in place or did you did you create the situation first and then work out how am i going to fix it yeah well there's um uh two things i mean can you um make a note to ask me about where the story came from because there's a there's a story there in itself okay. anyway um um and the time paradox thing, I thought I was being terribly clever <laughs> and original uh, by going, they see their future selves and their, their, their full I couldn't help but uh, think of the Space Museum, actually, when um, yeah, there's, that, that that's first episode. Much, it's not remotely original, <laughs> it's a Space Museum. Um, but um, I can remember being on a train from Greenwich with Simon Garrier, and I was going, I've got this, I'm doing this new story for Big Finish, um, and it's about the, the Doctor and his friends, and they see... They travel. They see their future selves and their dead bodies lying. And, and Simon said, "But you did that. <laughs> That's festival of death. You just are you doing festival of death again?" And I hadn't. I hadn't realised that. Um, but festival of death at the time was out of print and unlikely ever to be seen again. Um, and my attitude was that I didn't really want to do an audio version of festival of death because there'd be so many things in it I want to change and fix. And that Cobwebs was basically me doing an audio adaptation, adaptation of Festival of Death, um, where I take the bits of the story that were good, which had potential, and I get rid of all the bits that um, were very much all their time, should we say. Um, and uh, it has a different solution. 
that's the that's the other point is that um in Fessler death without wishing to spoil it, a book from 25 years ago the the, the corpses are other people um it's a it's mistaken identity whereas in cobwebs i was going we that's obviously the first thing people are going to think oh they and so you have things like them doing you know dna tests or whatever on the on the corpses to go no it's definitely them they're the right ages um and there's no way out and so and i sort of built the constructed the plot around that i mean you notice that every cliffhanger is about that problem coming back um you know end of part three is they are locked in a room where they know their bodies will be found dead in you know, 20 years time or whatever um so it become it and I, I wanted to make more of that i thought that was a really cool idea and my solution for it which is also i thought was uh really really cool i was really excited by it when i when i came up with it because it was just um it was doing the hidden in clear view thing um i mean spoiler warning it's a it's a it's a sort of a broken spring solution it's robots following their programming very literally and all it is is that the robots are trying to um uh rebuild them from the inside out but they only get as far as the skeletons and then they run out of power and that's i thought that was actually quite cool because it was it's the backwards way you know it's not the, these are bodies that have decomposed the skeletons they're being constructed outwards and that's as far as they got um so hopefully not everyone guessed that straight away <laughs> hopefully it came as a bit of a oh that's actually that was quite a cool moment i would forgotten it so it was a, it was a nice surprise so I, I, I was, yep. was thinking the whole story too. tried because i did listen before remembering how you saw but i couldn't remember how you did it till we got to the end i went oh that's right so yeah it's good so the other thing from festival of death is that the, there's the computer as well that's where because I, I had a computer in festival of death called eric um and in this one he's called edgar which uh has two sort of sources it's it meant i could do lots of king lear type sort of uh references because edgar goes mad in king lear and is sort of wandering around the more referring to himself in the third person but also um anyone who knows 80s pop culture will know the film electric dreams which has a home computer that comes to life which is called edgar as well so i was i was going well it's the 80s again it's um you know it's doctor who and tegan back together i'll put in a reference to this film and see if anyone picks up on it and i don't think i think i had to explain it to everyone because no one <laughs> knows that film so is this with death the one with the fendal is that right or am i mixing that one up the fendal no it's um it's little sort of robot spiders called cracktids which caused no end of amusement in the recording <laughs> um because obviously the doctor would say something like you know oh look out tegan there's crack tits coming and janet filled him and go crack tits did you say crack tits <laughs> and i would have to do it again so um uh i mean it was a it was a really enjoyable recording because it was you know janet was back in the building and that was lovely um so i was talking about your book the book the vessel of death is it does that have fendel that, that's not fendel. oh no the book no? um no no it's 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 completely original in some reasons. it's it's um oh, so that, that, has, that has these sort of spiders in it which are called oh, God, i can't remember what they're called now um arachnopods which are sort of spiders that can detach their limbs and stick them back on again kind of like um muppets or something uh which are quite fun because I, I remember i just gave them the catchphrase which is um eats must have eats as they go around scuttling about the spaceship uh one of one of I my mean, that book has like 300 pages and it has about 400 ideas in it so it's nothing it's it's a kitchen sink type thing of everything is in there far too much so where where did the story come from well that that that's an interesting thing um years ago back in the 90s uh when the new adventures were uh starting up i put together a pitch for one uh which was a story called the fear which was about a, a disease that um makes you paranoid and uh neurotic like the disease like victor syndrome in, in um 
cobwebs, the same thing. And it was set on a base, research base. And the the story was the doctor, not the doctor's companion, um, who at the time was, I think, Roz or something, uh, would get this disease. And so the doctor would cure the companion, but then he'd have to spend the whole story preventing the cure being transmitted out of the base because it would change history. Um, and it's an interesting moral dilemma. The doctor is trying to prevent something which will save millions of lives because he's trying to protect history, you know, the web of time, um, which I think is in cobwebs a bit. I think that's still in there. Um, but anyway, this was the story called The Fear, which I sort of worked up around 1993. Uh, I don't think I sent it in because I was getting, I couldn't keep up basically because they kept on changing the companions in the books and I'd, I'd write like five pages and then there'd be an announcement going, oh no, we're not having that. We've changed our plans. Um, and then after uh, Festival of Death, I pitched, I wrote it up properly and pitched it again uh, to BBC Books. And um, I, I think it was turned down or uh i um i did arachnophobia instead um but i i, I still thought it was a really strong idea um and i thought the uh, the, the idea of doing a historical story basically it's, it has the follows the rules of historical but it's set in the future it was um quite a cool thing to do because this is long before they did it on tv with waters of mars but it's a it's a similar sort of dilemma um, very similar sort of story. Uh, so yeah, it, it was a uh, one sort of pulled out of the bottom drawer, but it was also um, one where I couldn't find the copy. It was all from memory. So it was, um, and then years later, I found the actual um, thing I'd submitted, and it was really close. So I had remembered it really well, which I think is you know it shows the, the strength of the story if you can remember it. Did you you, you went to the recording? So you. What was the, what was the recording like? Uh, it was um, it was exciting. I mean, uh, there there is another story I have to tell you in a minute, but um, just remind me about um, the robot. That's the other thing to ask me about. Um, is that uh, it was Janet's first day back in the office, as it were, after you know, twenty years or thirty years or however long it was, twenty five years. Um, and so it was her first, I mean, she'd done the one with Joe Lidster where, where it was sort of um, a different sort of deal. Uh, but this was her trying to go, okay, you now have to play the character Tegan as you played her more or less in the eighties. So it's a different sort of thing. Um, and and there, was, there, were, there were discussions where she'd sort of just sort of go, this bit doesn't make sense. This bit in the script doesn't make sense. Where's the writer? Writer, you know, why does why does Tegan say this? And and Sarah's going. I think you'll find actually it does make sense if you look at the earlier scene. And and Peter's going. Of course it makes sense. They always make sense. And if they don't, it doesn't matter. And you have a five minute discussion where you go around the houses, um, changing the line, and then Joe go. Oh, hang on. I say it this way because of that. You go, yes. Oh, and so you, you put it all back out was. Um, and that was, uh, it meant that during the day I was working because I was e either having to do quick changes or rewrites or explanations um, because uh, Janet doesn't have the same sort of science fiction mind. She, she doesn't, you know, she's not going to be sitting down to uh, watch 12 Monkeys or whatever. Um, uh, so she wasn't, and with Doctor Who, you're sort of working on the basis that the person listening to it is already familiar with quite a lot of sci-fi. So you are doing the more difficult level, as it were. The more, and so that was nerve wracking to begin with. And then you, and then she, she got into the groove of it and going, oh, I understand what's going on now. It was, it was just the beginning. Because to be honest, I think that's my failure as a writer. I think I should have written it better. If it had been, if I'd written it better, it would have been clear. Um, and it wouldn't have needed additional explanations in the studio. I'm sure, that's not true. Do you want to talk about the robot? Oh, the robot. This is this is what where my frustrated plan, you see, because 
Um, and Nissa obviously needed someone to talk to as she was going on her missions. And so I wrote up this idea that she'd have a robot that um, was called Adric. Uh, and she, because she'd built it because in memory as a tribute to her, her dearly departed um, uh, fellow companion, which, which made me laugh to begin with, going, oh, and because the, the press release would come out and it would be Doctor Who Cobwebs with Doctor Nissa Tegan, Turlow, and Trick. And people would go mad. Um, but the, the other thing I was um, that made me laugh was at the time Matthew Waterhouse wasn't part of the Big Finish family. He hadn't, you know, returned to the fold. Um, they'd recast him, I think, in uh, Paul Mars' story. Um, so I was going, wouldn't it be funny if we brought Adric back and he was played by Will Wheaton? <laughs> From Star Trek, uh, wouldn't that be? Because at the time, Will Wheaton was not was not you know he hadn't done the Big Bang Theory. He was still quite cheap to get, I think, um, and I'm sure he would have loved to do it. Love to do a Doctor Who, um, and just the irony of bringing back Adric and getting the other Adric, the Adric from Star Trek, to play him, uh, and um, that was one of those things where I was told, "Not we're not doing that, Johnny. That's ridiculous. We, this is supposed to be a serious a serious project." So I changed him to Loki because it was all, it was all tying into the sort of Norse mythology of Timonus. Um, and, uh, but I, in my head, I think Adric would have been, that would have been much funnier. Well, because, is, um, didn't because you end up having a son called yeah, Adric in the this end? Is, this ends up with a son yeah. called Adric. Well, yeah, that was me. That was me doing it again. That was me getting what I could get uh, a year later or two years later. I could get away with it. By the time I just wanted to do, um, to have, I mean, I have a scene when this was going, oh, and Adric's here too. And I was going, what? Adric, no. And then this sort of, this little robot would trundle in with the voice of Will Wheaton. Um, in my head, that would have been hilarious, but I, I can see some people thinking it might be taking the mickey. Because it, because it <laughs> Quite possibly there. <laughs> yeah, but I, th I think you have to have fun with these, have to have fun sometimes. And, um, but we know we've got a very good actor in to play him, uh, uh, which is which is quite extraordinary. Um, Raymond. So yeah, sorry. Raymond Cothard. So yes, yes. He's he's done lots of you know really good. He does lots of costume drama and stuff. It was uh, it was one of those things where you sort of, sort of go, if I knew it, we're going to get a, a really good actor in, I'd have written the character better. Which is another. Another great lesson for a writer to go. Don't, don't they always get excellent actors in, Jonathan? You, yes. Um, you, you don't write any small parts. You don't. You, you write parts which are good for actors to play. Um, I mean, sometimes you can't. Sometimes it is second guard who has sees them, and that's the only line. You can't. You, sometimes you can't, but um, generally you are there to go. This actor is going to have this part on their CV, hopefully, you know, and they say you wanted to have a character to have a name and you wanted it to be something where they get to show how good they are, you know, or show what they can do. Um, so yeah, it was, a, it was a lesson there because obviously, but obviously Will Wheaton would have been fantastic. He's a very good actor. So that would, um, I wasn't sort of writing for a bad actor there at all. And still obviously Will Wheaton come in. Listen, Johnny, thank you so much for giving your time and for your thoughts and this Dwayne has anything else to ask. Okay, well, it's lovely talking about it. I'm, I'm always surprised that I remember anything, but it does come back, bits and bobs. You've done amazingly, as always, as well. I love talking to you. Thanks for your time, Johnny. Cheers, then. Well, our thanks once again to Johnny Morris for having a chat with us about cobwebs. It's always a fountain of knowledge, isn't he? He always it just all back comes flooding he back. He can't remember anything, and then he just keeps going and going. When he first pops up on our on our on our meetings, that's the first thing he says every time, isn't it? So yeah, I don't I think I remember. Really. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's good. I, I I was feeling for him though after spending a bit of time with Janet earlier this year. Um, his his stress at what her reactions might have been to his story. I could I could certainly empathise with how he might be feeling, and uh, how she could be a little bit imposing. But once you do get to know Janet a little bit, you realise that um, it's nothing to worry about, is it? No, Janet's just a big puppy she is. <laughs>
No, actually, I wouldn't say that to her. Don't say that. <laughs> Very good. Okay, so that's our two stories for uh, this episode of what we like to call We've Got Randomoids. <laughs> and I think it might be time to decide on the next couple of stories for our next instalment. And the reason I say decide, Philip, is because I want to do something a little bit different. Of course you like do. Us... Why would we do things the same? Oh, come on. I gave you plenty of warning. You did. I don't know what, I don't know what I that cryptic message was about. Um, I want to surprise each other with a pick for our next randomoid. So I've already thought of a story. And because whenever we're reviewing something or recommending <laughs> something, you go first. I think it's about time I went first. What do you reckon? Oh, okay. Yes, yeah, so do I. You go first. Like we're going to have a nice. You want to go first? You. Okay. Oh, you so go first. my my selection for for you and for us for our next randomoids is the adventures of Bernice Summerfield, the relics of Jegsau. Fantastic! I love it. So I'm interested in uh, Michael Kilgariff and the and the K15. Oh, I think it's I think in that it's K15 instead of K1. Uh, but still voiced by the same actor that uh, did it in Robots. So uh, I'm looking forward to giving that one another spin, Philip. Great. So how many in a box set can I give you? Oh, in a box set? Well, since since the um, the Bernice Summerfield one, only one episode. is is one episode, if you've got a if you've got a three part box set, let's do that too. Well, it's interesting you've moved outside the room of Doctor Who. I thought I'd move outside the room of Doctor Who too. So yep. you may not want to do this. So you can always say no. I thought, why don't we do the first series of the Omega Factor? Oh, excellent! Yes, With John Donnie and Luke Jameson. Have you listened to Yes, the let's do it because I bought them all, and I have yet to. I've, I've only listened to the first episode, so I haven't heard the other two yet. Okay, well, there, well there's four four short stories in the box set. Oh, let's let's do it. Okay, fantastic. So that's it. So for our next instalment, we're doing uh, Benny Summerfield, the Relics of Jeg Sow. Which, uh, which series is that from? Is it from about series four? I think it's series four, four five, five something like that. And, and, and I know it's a series where every single episode is a Doctor Who monster. So there's Sea Devils, there's, that, 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 there's two seasons of Doctor Who returning monsters and they're all brilliant. Yep. And we are doing the first, well, the Omega Factor, volume one. Do they call it Omega or Omega? Depends which country you come from. I don't know. I, I always get confused. I always say Omega. No, hang on. Omega, no, Omega Factor. But not lots of people say Omega Factor. But I don't know which country you, you've got to be from to say that. Well, we're going to have to listen to the box set and find out how they say it. And yes. say it how they say it. Do they say it in the show or is it uh, something that's just the title? Well, it will definitely be the promos. <laughs> yep. Fair enough. Very good. All right, well, it's been another enjoy enjoyable episode, uh, even, albeit uh, full of coughs and splutters from me. <laughs> I haven't been too well. <laughs> no, and Johnny wasn't too well either. And I, yeah, mm -hmm. oh, I mean, I was six, six weeks ago and I still got the cough. So it was a nasty thing, this thing that's going around. Yep. I knew I should have had that filter on my screen. <laughs> thanks. All right, until next time, thanks very much, Philip, and we'll catch Thank you all later. Thank you, Brain. Bye, everyone. This has been the Sirens of Audio episode 165, Randomoids 23, featuring the stories Death and the Queen and Cobwebs, with our guest Jonathan Morris and your hosts Philip Edney and Dwayne Bunny. Original theme music composed by Joe Kramer. More about us and tickets to Katie Manning in Australia from sirensofaudio.com. Comment below to let us know what you thought of the episode or contact us via email at sirensofaudio at gmail.com or via any one of our socials. Thanks for listening, audio files. We'll hear you next time. <laughs>